Today we're going to talk about trauma-informed care, and I see lots of social workers on today, uh, um, LMSWs, LCSWs, BSWs, uh, LPCs, nursing. I truly believe, those of us who work in this field, we're used to that word person-centered care. And person-centered care really came about in the early 2000s. We started switching to person-centered care when we realized this especially, especially in memory care, that we couldn't treat everybody the same. We finally figured out that we couldn't use uh, reality therapy in the 90s. I actually saw a textbook, a nursing textbook from the 1990s that taught reality therapy about trying to force somebody with dementia to come back to reality. It's horrible. Then in the early 2000s, we switched over to person-centered care. I really believe we're going to start seeing us use person-centered trauma-informed care as we move forward. Many of you are already doing it. You just may not know that you were doing it. We definitely know that it's needed. You will get a copy of these slides. So please, if you're a note taker, by all means, be taking some notes, but you don't have to copy all these slides down because you will get a copy. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can get started. Lots of information to share. Emily, everything looks okay, no problems, or Kellen? Yeah, everything looks good. Okay, thanks. There's my information, there's our objectives, but let's start with trauma, and I'm going to go ahead and start. I know we're going to have some more people join us, but I want to keep it to this hour. Um, I, I understand this is a, our coveted lunch hour, so we appreciate you being here. So let's start with what is trauma, because all of us have a different definition of trauma, but from the Center for Healthcare Strategies, let's talk about what trauma is, then we're going to look at the prevalence of trauma, and we're actually going to work into trauma with our patients, clients, and residents, and then we're going to look at trauma with our associates and our staff, the people that we work with day in and out, day in and day out, including ourselves. Keep in mind that trauma triggers trauma. Trauma ignites trauma. And what we have been through the last three years, we just had the anniversary, has been trauma. And for those of us who have trauma in our past, and we're going to look at the numbers in a minute and see that it's a high number of us that have trauma in our past somewhere, it may have reignited some stuff that you thought you dealt with or that you had dealt with and it's suddenly come back up because living through trauma ignites trauma. So let's look at what is trauma. It is an exposure to an incident or a series of events that's emotionally disturbing or life-threatening. And these are just the ones listed by the Center for Healthcare Strategies. We're going to look at others. And most of us, of course, we're going to automatically think of physical, sexual, or emotion, emotional abuse. But what about neglect, that childhood neglect? What about if we grew up with a family member that had a substance use disorder? Or if we have a family member that has a mental health disorder? Violence in the community, a human-made or a natural disaster, and forced displacement. We're right here in Texas, those of us that are here in Texas, and we had Katrina, we had Rita, we had, we've had hurricanes in New Orleans, we had Harvey down in Houston. Sudden unexplained separation from a loved one. There's the pandemic right there. And again, I want you to be thinking about as we go through this program, not just your residents, your patients, or your clients, but about you yourself and your staff members. We watched families get displaced. We were the ones having to displace them because we were having to implement the regulations and we saw what it did not only to our residents, but to the family members. I've shared the very first call that I got 
the first call that I took from a family member after we had to shut it down in March of 2020 was an adult son who probably was 70 something himself. His dad lived with him. His mother lived with us here at the West Center. And with tears, he said, I know mom's going to be okay. I know you've got her. She's going to be okay. But Holly, this is going to kill my dad. It'll kill him. In their 70 something year marriage, they've never been away from each other for more than three days. And you're telling me that we don't have a timeline on this thing? It's going to kill my dad. We've got to do something. And we were still deer in the headlights. And then poverty and discrimination is part of trauma. Let's look at some numbers and that prevalence for trauma. 83% of adults in the United States have at least one adverse childhood experience. Now you will hear these called ACEs. And the more that this comes into, as we use more trauma-informed care terminology, you're going to see just ACE out there, just so that you know that means an adverse childhood experience. 83% of adults have at least one. That means we've got 49 people on this call. That's the majority of us had at least one. But then look that 37% have four or more adverse childhood experiences. Think about how many clients or residents you serve. The CDC statistics also show that one in four of us in the United States is gonna experience some sort of abuse, either physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. And for many of us, there is a reason we went into this field, this helping field, counseling and social work and nursing. One in four women has experienced domestic violence. One in five women and one in 71 men have experienced rape. And 12% of women and 30% of men, they were less than 10 years old when this happened. This is going to play into our lives on down the road. Now let's put dementia on top of that. Where we know they are going through something called that theory of retrogenesis, where they are going back in time. And this trauma comes back. And what if we don't know about it? What if the family doesn't know about it? The immediate family that's taking care of them. And all of a sudden we start having those, you know, that term we use, those challenging behaviors, which by the way, we're trying not to use that term anymore. We're trying to say challenging expressions, challenging expressions. Behavior sounds really negative. They're doing the best they can with what they have. So we are trying to switch and just say they're having some challenging expressions. But these numbers mean that a large number of people have experienced trauma in their life. Now, here are some other examples of trauma. And what I did is I pulled some from some websites and then I listed some that I've seen myself in my career. Trauma-informed care, we're going to find out, understands why a person might turn to drugs or to alcohol or to food or compulsive shopping or whatever their vice is to numb themselves. And some of these, you may look at them and go, well, that doesn't seem near as severe as others. And it, it, because there are levels of, the, of trauma. Imagine that child who had a life-threatening illness and had to undergo treatments, and now as an adult, all needles make them very anxious. Doctors make them very anxious. And maybe if they have dementia and they can't tell us that, and they start to have one of those challenging expressions whenever the doctor comes in the room, but we don't know that they had childhood leukemia. We've got to know this. A lot of this is going to be on our intake and what we find out at intake and how we can do it better. A woman who's had multiple miscarriages or who has had failed um, IVF and they sob every time they have to have a 
examination. I've watched this happen. A man who was in the military taking cover or hiding when they hear thunder or when they hear sirens. Some of you have experienced this. We've got VA. And there's thunder outside or Wednesday at one o'clock here in Fort Worth when they blow the whistles because they're checking the whistles and they take cover because they've got PTSD. People who won't allow anyone to get close to them because they're afraid they'll cause harm. Let's look at the definition of, I used earlier, adverse childhood experiences. Again, that you're gonna see that called ACEs. And as we see more and more of trauma-informed care, I believe we're even gonna, gonna start seeing on intakes, we're gonna start having in our care plans where we're gonna put ACE and maybe and start listing their adverse childhood experiences. This is when before the age of 18, somebody experiences physical, emotional, sexual abuse, neglect, discrimination. They were exposed to violence. And because of this, and we're going to look at the reason why, it's really interesting when you study this. They then have a greater risk for chronic health conditions. They are also at greater risk for risky behaviors later in life. And we're going to find they're at greater risk for developing heart disease, depression, liver disease, sexually transmitted disease, and substance abuse. Some of those you can figure out why. But others, we're going to look at what happens to the brain whenever somebody under the age, under the age of 18 undergoes trauma. And the younger they are, the worse it can be because that brain's not fully developed yet. So what in the world happens to a person's health when they undergo trauma? And this again, there is a link that they have found between childhood trauma and lifelong health problems. For a person who had trauma before the age of 18, and then they develop these health problems later in life because of what's happening in their neurobiology. We know that that little brain is not completely formed. Now, think about that child. I always think about the child of younger than five. When a child has positive experiences in their life and they're producing that serotonin and they have that dopamine and they've got those endorphins, they're developing a healthy brain before the age of five. Now imagine that child before the age of five that's producing the cortisol and the adrenaline due to trauma and staying in the fight, flight, freeze and they're three, four, five years old. Their brain doesn't develop the same way. It actually, they have shown that it decreases the volume in areas of the brain. Now, this is huge. I taught school for 20 years, and I wish we'd have known this then, and teachers need to be taught this now. It actually decreases the volume in areas of the brain that are responsible for cognitive functions like short-term memory, emotional regulation, and other higher cognitive functions where they didn't learn, their brain didn't learn how to regulate their emotions because of what they were exposed to before the age of five. And then we end up with adults who can't regulate their emotions. And many times it is not because of anything that they did, it's because of what they were exposed to. Now we have some populations that are at a higher risk for trauma. People who are in low income communities, socioeconomic, ethnic and racial minorities, LGBTQ plus individuals, individuals with disabilities, and then women and girls. 
you can just find higher numbers of trauma in each of those populations. So what happens? We have to learn to cope. Somebody along the way taught you physical hygiene. Most of us, somebody taught us that physical hygiene, how to take care of ourselves physically, how to shower and how to bathe and how to comb our hair and brush our teeth and put on deodorant and all of that good stuff. But who taught us emotional hygiene? Now, this is all of us, whether we've got trauma or not. Where'd you learn your emotional hygiene? And for most people, it was from watching the adults around us. But if you were in a home where the adults didn't have any type of regulation of their emotions, what did we learn to cope? We learned unhealthy behaviors such as eating, tobacco use, drug and alcohol use, because it was all around us and the adults that we were watching. And that's what we thought was normal. And that's what we turned to to cope. And we'll see kids turning to food and drugs and alcohol and nicotine. They're accessible. But what do those then contribute to? Anxiety and depression and social isolation and eventually chronic illness. You can see where that then brings in the diabetes, the COPD, the sexually transmitted diseases. All of these, we can link them together. So those of us who work in healthcare, what is it that we can do that can help others that have trauma? First thing we've got to do is programs like this, where it at least comes to the forefront of our minds. Wait a minute. That means that almost everybody I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, my clients, my patients, my residents, and my coworkers have likely experienced some type of trauma in their life. And in the last three years, I've seen maybe a difference in a coworker or some of our associates and that they seem to be mad all the time. Or maybe I seem to be mad all the time. We know anger is the easiest emotion for most people to have. Again, anger is the easiest emotion for most people to have because we feel like we're in control when we're angry. Because if I start getting loud and I start getting really broad because I am standing and getting in a position to defend myself, then I feel like I'm in control. And so we get those family members coming in who are madder than heck at us over their loved one's fingernails, toenails, hair. They're wearing somebody else's clothes. We've all experienced this. And they're really mad. They're, it's an unusual. To, and it isn't about that at all. There's something else going on. We're going to talk about how we're going to know about this trauma, how we're going to get families to open up to us about the trauma, and then how we're going to figure out with our staff, with our associates about trauma. Now, if you are trained and if you are a provider who does therapy, some of the things that have been found to help when someone has trauma is ex uh, prolonged exposure therapy, uh, EMDR. That's kind of one of those words that we're using a whole lot of right now. Uh, trauma recovery empowerment models uh, that we can use with our clients. And that's a whole nother program. But there's lots of things out there. I'm actually working on um, trauma-informed therapy, tra trauma-informed type therapy for people who have dementia. So what exactly is trauma-informed care? And this is the most important thing to come out of this entire program today. I've put it in bold print. We as healthcare providers have to shift from what is wrong with you to what happened to you. There's the shift right there. What a difference. When we come in, 
And I'm gonna use dementia again as an example. And we have a resident who's having some challenging expressions. Rather than going, what is wrong with them? What if we said, what happened to them? Same with our staff. Instead of looking at an associate or a staff member that's having a hard time and going, what is wrong with them? What if we were able to say, what happened? What happened to you? What it comes down to as healthcare providers, we've got to have a complete picture of somebody's life, their past and their present, so that we can give them that person centered, individualized care. This is where they're going to tie together. Go to build trust with that family from the get go, from the beginning. We've got to build trust and we've got to be really honest with our families. We're doing everybody a disservice whenever we have a family come in and we try to tell them that we're going to fix or that we're going to make everything all better. We're not. With dementia, this is a progressive terminal disease. Are we going to focus on quality of life? Yes, we are. But part of us focusing on quality of life is knowing that background so that we can be ready some of y'all have had this happen. I sure had it happen where I was working late one night and had staff members come running to me because we had a woman who was barricading the door. She wouldn't let anybody in. And it got to where she was doing it night after night after night. And it was always after dark. You know where this is headed. We had a male CNA. And that male CNA was just going in to check on her. But it was a man coming in her room after dark. We didn't have anything that said there had been any trauma in her past. She would let me in. She got to where she'd let some of the other females in. When I called her son, son didn't know anything, and she only had one son. She, Mom had never mentioned that anything had ever happened. And it got to the point that I had him call his aunt the resident's sister, and just ask. And that sister just crumbled and said, oh my God, we, we didn't talk about that. We, didn't, we, we haven't talked about that in years. She had been sexually abused as a child and so had the aunt. And now we had a male caregiver coming in after dark and she was doing all she knew to do. It was not a challenging behavior. She was protecting herself. She was having an expression, but we needed to know that, but the son didn't know it to tell us those type of things that we need to look at. And instead of looking at that resident and going, what is wrong with her? What's going on? We had to come together as a team, as that IDT team and go, what might have happened to her? Let's go that route and not just throw a medication at it. What could we do? And it was temporary. When we know about this, when we know about trauma, it's been proven to improve a patient's engagement, to improve their treatment adherence and their outcomes. And then with staff, it's been proven for staff wellness. And we're gonna talk more about that. There's actually six goals of trauma-informed therapy. And the first one we're doing right now is we're understanding the impact, the widespread impact of trauma. And right now we all are in this state of what we could really call collective grief. Whether we've been calling it grief or not, this is grief. As we look back, I was on a great program last week that was done by Leading Age. And instead of using the term new normal, which I hate, and I know most of y'all hate that term new normal. I've said, I'm going to steal this. They use the term, we're in a stage now of reconstruction. This is reconstruction. We've, we're pulling out of that messy middle and we're in this reconstruction of how things are going to be going forward. But we've got to be able to say that we're grieving how things were and especially the things we're not going back to. We're just not going back to it. We've got some things that have changed that are permanent. And all grief is, is loss. 
doesn't necessarily mean there's been a death. It's just there's been a loss. We've got to know how to recognize those signs and symptoms, integrate knowledge that's part of what we're doing today, make sure we don't re-traumatize, work together for collaboration, build on strengths, and make sure that we are recognizing and addressing historical trauma as well. And again, you're going to get all of these slides. And then there's some benefits of trauma-informed care, and I hope that you can already see some of those benefits. In staff members, it reduces burnout. It's been shown to reduce burnout. And for patients or residents, it offers actually an opportunity for them to start to engage more in their own health care. Imagine, especially if we have a, a resident who doesn't have dementia, if we can open up and allow them to talk about things and we start to build trust with them as their healthcare provider. And it's going to improve those long term health outcomes. There's also six principles of trauma informed care, and we're going to go through each of these um, a little bit more. I'm going to try to make sure and leave some time for any questions at the end, but I wanted to make sure and show you these things because, again, this is an overview of something that I think we're going to see more and more. And we're going to talk about how to uh, implement trauma-informed care where you are. There's some key ingredients for trauma-informed care, and this is from the Center for Healthcare Strategies. There's, uh, they're listed in two separate columns there. There's organizational ingredients and there's clinical ingredients. In the organizational, we're going to talk a lot about how to train clinical as well as non-clinical staff members. Because think about wherever you are located, how many different staff members come in contact with your clients or your residents. Lots of times it isn't the clinical who realizes or recognizes things. It's housekeeping. It's culinary. It's our life enrichment team. We've got to have them trained just as well as we've got to train our non-clinical. It's the front desk. Everybody, the whole team. For our staff, we've got to make sure that they feel safe at work. And today that is more important than ever. And we're going to talk about some ways to do that. They've also got to feel safe emotionally. They're not being threatened in any way emotionally. Again, we never want to have a secondary traumatic event happen, and we don't want to re-trigger anything. And we're going to talk about some ways that we can even hire a trauma-informed workforce and what that'll look for look like. Whenever we're doing an intake, there's ways that we can screen for trauma. And I think as we're talking to families, what I have found is if we just ask with compassion and we explain why we're asking and maybe even use an example or a story so that the family understands this is, it's not that we're trying to get into your business. We're not uh, just trying to be nosy. We need to know these things moving forward so that we can provide the best individualized, person-centered, trauma-informed care for your loved one. Ways that we can do that, how we begin is with empowerment using a person's strengths and empowering them, allowing choices to be made. We've got to make sure we have lots of collaboration where we are all working together. Developing that sense of safety. And again, we're going to talk about ways to do that. And along with safety comes trust. That means that at our workplaces, we've got to have a culture of staff wellness. And I want you to think if you're already at some place that promotes staff wellness, what might be some of the things that you're doing to promote some employee, some staff wellness? And by wellness, it isn't just physical wellness, social and emotional as well. So let's look at that first one a little bit deeper. 
And the first one is build awareness and generate buy-in for a trauma-informed approach to care. Because all of us, many of us on this call, we've been in the business a long time. We don't want this to just be another one of those, well, here's the phrase, here's the new keyword that's out right now, and then it's just a flash in the pan. This isn't going to go away. We're on to something here. This is not going to go away. So how do we do that? We've got to offer trainings to all staff, again, all staff, so that everybody understands what trauma-informed care is. Some ways that we can do that, we can work, put them into workshops. We can do like we're doing right now, where it's just a lunch and learn. We're going to do an hour over lunch, bring your lunch. We're going to talk about this. Offering resources, if you have a resource table where people, for, where your staff and your residents' family members can pick up information on trauma-informed care. There's lots out there. If you go online, just make sure you're going through a reputable, uh, and I've got a resource page that you'll get with this. We're also going to want to make sure and incorporate trauma training into our regularly scheduled staff meetings. Whenever we do trauma training, as hard as it can be sometimes, and sometimes doing a trauma training can maybe trigger something in someone, but then it makes you feel so much more powerful. Who in the world would have ever thought that we would have to have active shooter trainings in long-term care? We have had it. As a teacher, we sure had active shooter trainings when I was teaching school, but I was teaching long before we ever, long before Columbine, because that's when it started. And I never thought that I'd see active shooter trainings in a school. Your church may have had it. Our church has had active shooter trainings at church. But once we've had that training and then we know what to do, if God forbid it ever happened, we take that power back. Supporting that culture of staff wellness, what are some things that we can do? And again, education is always going to be first. Talking about what does burnout look like? What does compassion fatigue look like? And if you find yourself headed in that direction or you're there already, what are some things that you can do about it? I did an hour and a half program yesterday for the Area Agency on Aging on resilience, compassion fatigue, and burnout in healthcare workers. So we have that. You can also go to our website um, and our YouTube page and find those. We've got to encourage people to take that PTO for mental health days. We used to laugh about that and would say something like, oh, I need a mental health day. Well, now we do need a mental health day. We need to take some time off, not to necessarily go and do something, but to not do anything. We work in a high stress field and many of us in healthcare have not been taking care of ourselves because for the last three years, we've been taking care of everybody else. And this is a hard statistic, but in 2020, 31% of all suicides were healthcare workers. 31% of all suicides were healthcare workers in 2020 because we've got the degrees, we've got the diplomas, we've got the certificates, and we help everybody else. And we get to thinking we don't need any help. I'm going to turn to, and lots of it, those unhealthy things that maybe we'd stopped using and we pick them back up again. And that's us that work in healthcare. Some other things that we can do at work. What if we did three to five minutes of deep breathing at shift change? Or if we taught mindfulness? I'm in charge of the resource table here. And I left, I started putting some mindfulness exercises out on our resource table for staff. And people were grabbing those up. I even put some adult coloring out there. Just things that we can do for ourselves. Stretches during lunch breaks. Lunch away from the desk. Oh, there's a big one. Or here's what I did because I do lunch at my desk, but I watch a TED Talk. You know, TED Talks are 10 to 20 minutes, I think is the longest. 
So I started doing at least a couple of times a week. I refused to sit here and keep working. I started going, I'm going to do something that's good for me. And I started watching TED Talks at lunch and found a lot that I could pass on to other people. That's part of our wellness. I used to work at a place that every day at three o'clock at the corporate headquarters, every day at three o'clock, everybody in the entire place stopped what they were doing and went out and walked. They were located very near a golf course that had a walking track and you could continue your meeting, but it was now a walking meeting, but it stopped. So that's healthy. That's staff wellness. That's looking out for everybody. And they encouraged all of us to do that in our communities as well. Have a time every day, and then you have to do it. it takes 28 days to make or break a habit. So you got to do it 28 days in a row for that to become a habit. Or you might need to stop something. And so you have to stop doing something for 28 days to stop that habit. Then we've got to hire that workforce that embodies the values of trauma and care. So that first bullet point, include interviewers from a variety of cultural and racial backgrounds, as well as different levels within the organization during the interview process. So that we mix it up. We don't just have the same one person who's doing the hiring. You can even have behavioral interviewing strategies where you look for characteristics like empathy. That's a big one. We teach that in orientation. We're about empathy, not sympathy. We're not feeling sorry. We're coming alongside. And the other thing we're looking for is non-judgment. Someone who's not judgmental. The way we can do that is in an interview, we can ask questions about how they've handled previous situations. That gives us an idea of how they might behave in future situations. We can also incorporate some questions about trauma into the interview process without crying. And then we've got to create that safe physical, social, and emotional environment. Some ways that we can do that. People who have histories of trauma, we can feel unsafe in unfamiliar environments, which can then lead to anxiety or stress. And sometimes it's little bitty minor changes that have to happen so that we're not re-traumatized. I want to share one that happened with me. And you will see a picture of a parking lot. And this parking lot is very well lit. A lot of times people who have trauma in their past have a hard time walking through a dark parking lot. And we might not even realize that we're getting very, very anxious on our way to the building. But you can imagine that if you have trauma in your past and you've had to park out where the employees park and you're walking up to work through a dark parking lot, but the whole time you're, because you're on guard many times when you're someone who's had trauma in your past, you're just kind of on guard all the time. And then you come in to clock in and you clock in and you're anxious and maybe you're sweating and you might not even understand what just happened to you. And it was because the lights were out in the parking lot. And you can't even name, why am I suddenly so anxious? We've got to empower our associates to be able to come in and say, I did this. I went to our CEO and said, we've got some lights out, out there. And boy, that was upsetting me walking through the parking lot in the dark. That's an easy fix. Those are easy things to fix. We've got to monitor who's coming in and out and the noise levels. We've got to be careful about using overhead speakers. And then when we come in, we need to have a warm reception. That's where at the front desk, I tell you, we have more compliments about people at the front desk because of the way we greet family members coming in residents coming back from places, and associates coming to work, to greet them every day, to have some flowers there, to have some sunshine coming in, to do something so that when we come in, we're not dreading coming into this place. This is a good place to come. 
This all goes into trauma-informed care. The signs that we put on the wall, listen to the difference. Please refrain from using your cell phone in the lobby versus no cell phone use in the lobby. There's just a difference of a couple of words, but it makes a difference. Training our staff that's right at the front desk how to have a warm and welcoming manner. It sets the tone for the visit for the families coming in. It sets to the tone for the staff coming in. And these are pretty easy fixes. We also have to train our staff on how to talk to family members, resident family members. I do a role play during our orientation and I remind our entire staff because we are all memory care. That's all we do. So any family member who comes here, any family member that comes, when they do that kiosk at the front, they are coming to see someone that they love who has a terminal illness. And with dementia, they're not losing them in a week or a month. They're losing them over the course of years. The statistic is three to 20 years. So maybe they might come up to us because we've got this badge on or we've got those scrubs on. And they may talk to us in a way that maybe they wouldn't normally talk to us. And it has to do with their own trauma and what's going on with them. And how do we properly respond back to that? And another thing we talk about is how to talk to each other. We all have lives outside of these walls. And we just saw that 84% of us have trauma. How do we talk to each other? Basic communication skills. It's not something that they're teaching in all the schools nowadays. What if we did that with our staff? Again, with creating that safe social and emotional environment, keeping consistent schedules and procedures, keeping things consistent, it's very important for our associates. Maintaining communication. Usually if we were to put out a, a complaint box or a what could we do better box, communication is gonna be number one over and over and over again. So if we can be consistent and we can be open, respectful and compassionate. I know that during COVID we started having, of course, Zoom meetings, bringing everybody online. And sometimes we had to come together just to say, we don't know anything else, but we wanna let you know that we don't know anything else. We're not keeping anything from you. We'll let you know as soon as we do. We did it with the families too. We're letting you know as we know. We know you're scared. We're scared too. Open communication. Even if we were saying we don't know anything and we're doing it in a compassionate way. And then the next thing is anticipating emotional responses and avoiding that re-traumatization. Keeping in mind how to avoid the re-traumatization. Sometimes in memory care and dementia care, it can be our approach. Our approach can trigger those challenging expressions. Our words and our tone can trigger challenging expressions because we know for a fact that people who have dementia even though their hippocampus is going to die their facts nouns those words are going to die the hippocampus those facts are going away their amygdala lives and we know that amygdala holds feelings and emotions so we've got to be careful with our tone our facial expressions our body language, because even when they can't understand the words, they understand the tone. And they read us all the way till end of life. They can read us. We've got to keep that in mind. and We've got to make sure that our associates know that.
Some of the things that we might do is offer opportunities for our staff to actually explore their histories. You might bring in somebody from the outside and offer um, some monthly support groups. You may have the um, employee assistant program where they might can do some counseling sessions online or over the phone and encourage that. And don't treat counseling or therapy as something that is bad something that is good. It's something to work through and it's something that we offer. Take advantage of it. That's what I always tell uh, associates is take advantage of this. If you've got three free sessions, I'm signing up. Give me three free sessions. Absolutely. Encourage. We offer three free sessions with me to our family members. Three sessions with a licensed professional counselor that you get to come in and talk about what you need to talk about after the placement of your loved one. What a great thing to have. And lots of times they only need to come once or twice because they just need somebody to hear them. It's not trying to fix it. Because when they talk to their family, their family tries to fix it. And then allow people to take those mental health days if they're needing them. I encourage you to go to this website. It's called bettercareplaybook.org. And I'll have this on my resource page as well, which is coming up next. And this is for some additional tips. But again, bettercareplaybook.org is a great place to go. And it gives you ideas on how to adopt a trauma-informed approach and how to implement it and realizing that it's not a one-size-fits-all. What might work at a long-term care facility might be a little bit different at an assisted living, might look a little different at a hospice community. And so you've got to play with it a little bit and make it yours. And it also takes time. This isn't one of those that we go, okay, today we're going to implement. It takes some time to do this. You've got to find those champions. You've got to find those folks that are going to be your trauma-informed care champions. And I encourage you that if you do get a team together to do this, have somebody from culinary, have somebody from housekeeping, get you somebody from laundry, have people from nursing, get someone from the front desk. Try to have that uh, interdisciplinary team to help you incorporate and have trauma-informed care. And I've got on there in that third bullet point that non-clinical staff like front desk or dietary that still interacts with the residents play a huge role in making that resident feel safe a huge role. Make sure we include them in all of our trainings and in all of our awareness building. We also need to get that buy-in from senior leadership. We got to start at the top, but they've got to understand how important this is. Here's some resources. These are all of the places that I went to gather information, and these are also the places um, that I go to get the newest statistics. You see there, we talked about ACE, and there's a website, aceisaware.org, uh, trauma-informed care, and that's part of CHCS. Here's my information, and if this is something you're interested in doing um, at your place, you can give me a call, talk about the things that we've done, uh, or if you've got any other questions, let me stop sharing. This is a one hour CEU. You will get the um, video later today. You will also get a copy of the slides. We will ask you to do a, um, to fill out the little, I think it's a, a Google survey, and then we'll get you that CEU later. Let me look in the chat real quick. I know we've got about 10 minutes. Let me check. If anybody has anything, you can put it in the chat. Oh, thank you for sharing this story. Thank you, everybody. And especially, again, if you do work with veterans, um, if you can get as much information as you can, and if you work with anybody who uh, was a police officer, a firefighter, and those of us who, again, social workers, social work and counselors and teachers and people that are in helping fields. Lots of times we've had stuff happen. 
We've had stuff happen in our past. So thank you very much. Again, you'll get this information later. I appreciate y'all being here today. And we did finish a little bit early. So you got a, a few minutes left. Um, thank you so much. We'll send this out after a while. Bye-bye.